Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm Jenny Rooney. I'm with Forbes, and I'm thrilled to be with these folks today uh, for what's going to be quite a fascinating conversation around um, the new marketing normal. Uh, and uh, we're dubbing this conversation the modern marketer's dilemma, the new balance of left brain and right brain. Obviously, this is something that I think all marketers have been negotiating and dealing with over many years, but 2020 has brought that all into relief. Uh, clearly, winners are those who are going to be really fast and nimble, and data is central to that now more than ever before. But I think what's really interesting and what we're going to get into here is not only is data, you know, sort of the, the, uh, the imperatives around data have transformed this year, but the creative, the needs around creative uh, and fast moving development of new and innovative ideas is going to be key now more than ever. So we're going to get into that. Um, and we're going to think about and talk about how these CMOs and marketers who are joining me today are thinking about how they need to lead their teams in bringing together the left brain thinking, the right brain thinking in new and faster ways. Um, and we certainly have to think about skills development, right? And how teams are gonna be structured and developed and brought together to respond to this new normal, to, to respond to these new demands, uh, both in terms of the data imperative, as well as in the creative innovation that's going to be necessary, um, arguably, in hyperdrive. So without further ado, I'd love to uh, have my panelists introduce themselves because I think they can share uh, best a little bit about who they are, what they oversee, and um, perhaps how long they've been in their roles. So Angela, I'll hand it off to you. And if you could share just a couple words about yourself, that'd be great. So welcome. Great. Thank you, Jenny. So good to see you and happy to be here with everyone. Uh, really a terrific panel and couldn't be more thrilled. I'm Angela Zapeda. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Hyundai Motor America. I'm in Fountain Valley, California. I don't know why we call it Fountain Valley. There's no fountains and there's no valleys, um, but it's in uh, beautiful Orange County. Um, I am back in my office. There's a handful of us who are back, um, so it's a little weird, a little lonely, but I am here. Um, I'm responsible for all the marketing and advertising for the U.S. market which is uh, the largest market for Hyundai currently. So thrilled to be here. Thank you. Great. Chad, over to you. Okay. Hi, Chad Stubbs um, here in uh, the Lower East Side of New York City. Um, it's, it's alive and well. We are eating on the streets and loving it. Um, but I have actually been uh, with Moet Hennessy only about six months, and I'm learning um, all about our you know incredible portfolio. But um, my charge with that portfolio is um, I run the consumer connection and investment team. And so it's everything, it's bringing you know, luxury uh, from media to moment of choice. So it has uh, the CRM team, the media, uh, entertainment, um, any consumer connection plus uh, all of trade marketing. So, um, so can't wait to uh, talk about uh, all of my dilemmas with everyone. Um, and Bonin, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Triller. And then, of course, last but certainly not least, Susan will have you close close out the intro. So, Bonin, sure. please. Of course. Hello, Trade Desk. How are you guys? I uh, hope everybody's enjoying uh, their time at home. Uh, I am the opposite side of you, Chad. I'm in Chelsea. So, uh, and it is a lot. I'm, I used to say I'm reporting live from the epicenter, but now from the former epicenter, I guess. Uh, yep. Bon and Bao. I'm sure you guys, uh, some of you know kind of my past life. I work with Chad at PepsiCo. Uh, I was chief media and commerce officer for Mondelez for many years. Before that, built two global digital agencies. Uh, and now I'm on the platform side, which is kind of a, a weird change i guess i'm seeing the entire industry 360 now and um i am chief growth officer for triller uh which means that i have both marketing and revenue underneath me uh which is interesting because i think it's really the ability to really work with customers and do things that are both driving their business from a sales perspective but also integrating triller uh and even co-sharing co-marketing with folks so we're trying to bring a unique perspective uh we are a short form video platform uh, many say we're competitive with some of the other ones that you know although we don't see ourselves that way we see ourselves as part of culture and really where culture comes and culture breaks the real difference between us is that our ethos is we help creatives monetize their creativity for example in music we have have licensing deals with 97% of 
all the uh, rights protected music in the world, which means when a user puts up a video with music or an artist does, that artist actually gets credit for that through our patented tech with Apple and, and uh, Spotify called social streaming. So the artist gets paid. And th those rights even follow if you share off platform. So really helping artists and influencers build their business inside of a short form video platform, number one uh, platform in the app store, uh, first to ever do it in 80 countries concurrently and size wise comparative to the other guys that you know in the marketplace. So I'm just excited to be here. Many friends on the panel and uh, Jen, as always, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And Susan, uh, kudos to the Trade Desk for, for hosting this, for um, having this incredible panel here today. Uh, Susan, share a little bit about yourself as well. First thing, Jenny. So thank you so much. And thanks to this amazing panel for being a part of the Groundswell Digital Marketing Festival. We've been, we've been having a lot of fun at the Trade Desk putting this on this week. And it's great timing because I think we're all taking stock about, about what we've been through in the past five or six months and then where we're going headed into the holiday season in Q4 and into 2021. So thank you all for, for being here. Um, I'm Susan Bobeda. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of the Trade Desk. I've been in the role for three years. I, um, the Trade Desk is a demand side platform, a software platform that agencies and some brands use to buy digital media uh, using data in an automated fashion. Um, we've had an amazing ride building our brand and our company. Um, certainly it's a 10 year old company, but over the last you know, handful of years, it's really um, been a big growth story and just a lot of fun to be a part of. So really happy to be here and talk about um, marketers today. So let's start by having, you know, I mentioned data, the data imperative. Let's talk a little bit about how you all see this year really um, accelerating, you know, the focus on data and measurement and everything that marketers are doing. Angela, I'd love for you to kick it off and talk about it from the Hyundai perspective. Well, thank you, Jenny. And I didn't follow instructions well even this morning. Uh, I've been in the role for just a year, just under a year. Yeah. So, <laughs> and know. it's the first year it's been. Um, but I will say I was at the advertising agency for Hyundai before being asked to come be in this role on the Hyundai side. So I was very, very familiar with the territory. But um, so it always feels longer than it technically is in the role. But this this has been um, incredible to live through. Who would have ever thought we would need so foo. all Can of you our best AC people. on. Yes. Um, and I, you know, we've always had a lot of data at our fingertips. Um, it's just part of the automotive business. In fact, we sometimes have so much data. Um, it's it's just a very big and complex business. But when it comes to marketing and advertising with our budgets, you know, every dollar really does need to work very, very hard for us. Um, and there are multiple tiers in which that money comes into play and where that investment gets made. So you really can't do it without data. Um, but what happened with, I think, COVID was that instantaneously, you know, the world which we could predict out fairly well based on all the data that's always available, suddenly everything was thrown up into the air. And that new normal was that there was no constant and the biggest thing we saw right away was that the country was not even getting affected by COVID in the same way. So in some parts of the country, let's take Arizona in those early days, they were, our dealerships were still selling, still, you know, were pretty much living as they were before, not so affected by COVID. Of course, the East Coast and New York City completely shut down right away. And so that difference of how we were able to actually sell vehicles to consumers across the country instantaneously had us accelerate our need for using data. And we wanted to be very sensitive about um, messages we put into the marketplace. People were hurting, people were getting sick, people were worried to fight about finances. And yet in other parts of the country, things were just still the same. So we had to use data to be able to know exactly what message we needed to put in which market to the right audience you know at the right time and that was a very fluid time we were constantly adjusting um almost every single day so like everyone else we couldn't really do a lot of new production we were using um just everything we had to put together messages and and doing that very quickly through our platforms and and so data just became the tool that we had to rely on in order to make the best choices we could in the moment um because you really tried to get it as right as you could but you know, like everyone, it, we didn't have the playbook. So we, we had to use the data to really um, help us through that time. And I, I would think for us, that was the biggest thing that we did. We just used everything 
and it was just exponential. Jen, yeah. does any of this resonate for you? I mean, how do you how how were you all thinking about this or responding to or noting uh, the shifts that were happening, and how did you lean into the data or have to? Well, I mean, and Angela and I had bonded earlier on this topic, right? Because remember, we're we're both strangely enough similar in similar businesses where we don't control kind of the end user. That's through a whole third party sort of situation, and um, and so you know there. Uh, I think we both have joked that um, we're a little envious of some of those uh, end-to-end, uh, you know, companies like a Casper or something where you know yeah. the full line and you can see instant response. Um, but no, the, what it became clear to us was the power of both um, what information we did have, but also our one-to-one relationships. So that then became even more critical because then we could a- absolutely, that was our one way in of, you know, within our, you know, uh, database with our, you know, uh, direct to our consumers, what was they, you know, what were they actually responding to? And, um, and you know, kind of leveraging a little bit of that real-time feedback. I'd also say that we um, leaned in to, you know, a little bit, I'd you know, argue a little more social listening than we probably had in a while because our, you know, category had been fairly static on most kind of social listening things. I'll, I'll admit it was a little, you know, it was one of the more boring categories because, you know, it was like, oh, that's delicious. And, um, <laughs> and suddenly, you know, suddenly it became like, you know, what, what are you doing um, for a, a bunch of these, you know, things that have risen up through this year? So I think that absolutely helped us in um, crafting a little bit of response, admittedly in a world where there isn't a lot of data, in, you know, kind of uh, entire industry. So, so let's talk now about the implications on cr- the creative. And I mean, let's move beyond just talking about campaign management, right? And sort of the, the particulars of that. I mean, what, what happens to creatives in this new environment where, you know, change has to happen so dramatically and so quickly um, on a dime, what are the impacts in terms of how creatives need to rethink, you know, how they're delivering and how they work in this new environment. And uh, Susan Bonin, I'd love for you to to, um, share your perspectives on this. Um, Susan, please, go ahead. Oh, thank you, Bonin. Um, I'll go and then you. Uh, So um, creative and storytelling has never been more important, particularly when sort of the reality of how we're living our lives is changing so dramatically and we're faced with something, you know, really challenging as human beings. Um, So uh, obviously our relationship to the world and our lives and our families has really been altered in the last six months and we're going through a lot emotionally and brands need to really understand that it's, it's almost the, the emotional intelligence of brands (laughs) needs to heighten to speak into a new world for consumers in an insightful way. And um, it is an opportunity to recognize what people are going through and then resonate with them emotionally. And we all had to do that very quickly in the um, March and April timeframe. Um, Jeff Green, our our, uh, CEO talked yesterday on his panel about how um, brands really pause during that timeframe. I think if you're a a lead marketer or part of a marketing organization, you, you would think of that as a kind of a, a scramble and a regroup maybe um, like very quickly to think, to really understand the context of, um, you know, your brand in the current environment. Um, one of the things that we did at, at the trade desk were a B2B company, company obviously. Um, and we were just about to launch a new um, digital marketing and education platform called the Trade Desk Edge. We were probably four weeks away from doing that when COVID hit. And this was something we really recognized we could um, move up quickly and help people who were in transition. There was a lot of you know, job transition. People were at home really wanting to educate themselves on new trends in digital marketing and connected television is certainly one of them. And we moved that up that launch from you know four weeks out to seven days out, which as all of you know, who are marketers, that's no small feat by by our amazing team. One of the competitive advantages I think we've had in general, but certainly helped us um, through this period was um, an investment in internal creative resources. We both work, we work both with an internal creative team and with agencies, but as we're marketing a complicated product, um, we saw building early on three years ago, building a, an internal creative team as a competitive advantage for our brand. And it, 
it paid off in spades in our ability to adjust and adapt quickly as we went through the spring and we're going through COVID. All right. You know, I think um, it's an interesting question. I just want to touch back on kind of the initial question just around kind of data and what the real future of it is. Most people don't know this, but when I quit Mondelez, it was because I was living in China and I was watching WeChat grow. And I said to myself, the most amount of human attention is being spent in messaging. And I've seen this before. That means I can have a true one-to-one relationship. So I quit to invest in messaging tech. I think I have 12 companies in the messaging space. And then I came across a, a, the largest natural beauty business, Sundial, and he asked me to join as chief growth officer. I was hesitant because I didn't want to get back into it, but I ended up saying only if you let me build the business on capturing people's phone numbers. And he said, what? I said, trust me on this. And so over the next 12 months, we took a $200 million business to a $300 million business, and then we sold it to Unilever for a little under a billion, all using phone numbers to drive an e-commerce world because we had true one-to-one data. Then we went even further, and during that time period, we had beauty specialists that would text with those consumers and capture real information about their beauty tips, their habits, their hair consumption. And when you step back and you think about it, and I wrote about this a while ago, most of the companies that exist today are still data poor, and the ones that are really winning right now have figured out how to be data rich. And when you look, at those, they've been able to accelerate their growth at a pace that we've never actually seen before. And so I think the most important thing with data is not just only capturing it, and most companies aren't even on the journey fast enough in comparison to some of the guys that are nipping at their heels. Now, they're bigger, they're going to win ultimately, but they can accelerate that growth faster. But it's also choosing what you care about within that data that's going to give you competitive, uh, you know, a competitive advantage. And so I think that that, for me, is really there's an the art even in the selection of what I care about. Uh, and then I think when it comes to creative, I'm glad you brought up COVID because, you know, I really give a huge kudos and nod to our industry for doing all the things that we never thought we could do. You know, how many times have you sat in boardrooms and it's like, whoa, it's going to take us, you know, four months to get new creative. Well, guess what? Four days people got creative out and, you know, and we created a muscle memory because we had no choice. Right. And so hopefully, because at the end of the day, What's really going to be successful, to your point, are those that can use that data to inform messaging and creative. And it's not new discussion, but we've never really seen it happen to so many companies at such a short period of time. And the hope for me is that many of those organizations are not going to lose the fact that they proved how really, truly nimble they could be given no other options. And hopefully that becomes part of practice because that's ultimately what's going to change growth trajectories. And when I think about like our platform, Triller, for example, so talking about changing creative based on data. So you know, we're an artist first platform, music first. We have 26 double platinum albums that are just correlated to the streams off our platform. But when I look at the artists like a little Nas X who started off on Triller, when you look at those creatives, what they have learned how to do is read the user metrics, not just engagement or number of users, but really taking into account comments, even introducing those into songs. Or when you look at um, like some of the songs that have been created just based on challenge trends that have happened in these short form video platforms. When you step back and think about creatives, these guys are creating multi-million person engagement strategies, if you want to think about it, based on real-time adjustments to their own creativity. And so I think it's a real interesting example from a, when you look at it from a, you know, from a, just a case study of how they at the core of being creatives have been able to change the way that they engage with the consumer by staying close to that data pool and access set that they have. So I do think that we're going to see that continue to happen more and more. My only hope, though, for the industry is that we take what we learn from the muscle memory that we have created, albeit not as long as it might take to instill it forever, but that we focus on keeping that because it's going to make us better able to take advantage of a data rich world. I think that's one of the things that I'm so fascinated by is what are the what are these changes that are short term and what are what are permanent and here to stay. And I mean, marketing leaders have to take that upon themselves to be able to identify those as well and drive them through their organizations and through their strategy as they move forward. But obviously, everything you all are talking about has huge implications implications on skills, right? And and the talent imperative has been something we've talked about too for many years now, thinking about who do we need to be hiring? What, you know, who do organizations need to have in house? Who do they need to be working for externally? Um, But that skills question, again, this year, it's it's just sort of everything is, um, and I use that term 
brought into relief, right? When everything's just so clear that everything crystallizes in terms of needs, um, how would how would you all characterize the skills that are necessary? A that we have now in the industry and within organizations, but then also um, that we need to now be thinking about acquiring to be successful moving forward and really to be bulletproof for the future. I invite anybody to hop in because I'm sure this is something y'all are. Bonnie, maybe you would want to just follow what you were just talking about now. Uh, this conversation. Wow, I, surely I would, Jen. Um, and by the way, Chad, <laughs> I have the same TV as you. I'm going to send you a photo because it looks like I'm literally looking at my living room, just FYI. Um, yeah, I think that better data science, I think the ability to, like I look at, like we have a baby food business, which is a DTC business. And uh, again, it's text to buy, text to talk. Clearly I love text, but I look at as that business expands rapidly, the scrutinization that they have on the data sets that they're looking at. And I think that the first skill set is going to really be, um, is really going to be better data science. I worry that if you look again at the guys that are rely on data for every decision, they have much better data science and they're choosing data selection pieces that are truly going to give it's not just about cac or you know lifetime value but they're choosing the data sets that are really going to have them stand out like how do you stand out against another baby food company that's looking at potentially the same exact data what are the selection criteria you're making that's going to give you that advantage and i think that's going to require a better sense of data science i think there's got to be a belief system too i think a lot of this always relies on do you believe that this is going to be the future uh and then the funny thing is I actually think more than just the skill sets, more than just the type of people we need to bring in, identifying the skills that we need and then truly training against that. Because what I find fascinating, again, is given no other options, everybody across the organization learned how to change and adjust quickly to a changing environment. And so I, I think that, you know, I, I love talent a lot. I've talked about talent for years. And I do think that we have so much value in the people who sit inside of our organization today because they have perspective of the organization. But I feel like we as organizations do them a disservice because we don't push them to have to operate differently in a changing world continually. And I think we saw the potential of them to do that during COVID. And so now the question is, is what are the things that we want to accomplish? You know, I, I, we were talking to, uh, you know, the CMO of Levi's and they said, look, we never thought we could choose the new line over video conference. Well, guess what? We did it. And so now the question is, is, is that, are those the skill sets that you want to be able to maintain? So I think that that's for me is even bigger than what skill sets. And I'll let the other folks kind of, you know, jump in, I'll shut up. But I think how do we pressure our people to truly be able to continuously evolve themselves? Because right now I think we do a disservice to our folks by not putting that pressure on them. Yeah, I'll jump in. And um, you know, I think I think I totally agree with everything you said. I, you know, I think for years we hired a lot of specialists who were to come in, data scientists who were just solely focused on the data, reporting on the data. But you know, as we've grown with so much data at our fingertips, it's really about being able to interpret that data and being able to use that data to understand the what, the how, and then the why. And without that interpretation that gets you to move forward, then it's just a bunch of reporting. And I think that specialized skill set has evolved where it doesn't matter where you sit in an organization or what your main job is, to be able to understand that data and to apply it in a very thoughtful way that ladders up to an overall strategy to hit your goals, that is a really important part of it because you do have to decipher what is the right data for you in that moment and what's the data, like to your point, what do you trust in? What actually ladders up to your strategy? You know, is this the right thing to move forward with? And then there's that other skill set of just being able to interpret that to be able to move forward. And I, I think that holistic thinking, um, and, you know, reminds me a lot of how people um, are in a in a creative ad agency. You know, sometimes it's multiple skill sets that make the most successful people in that environment. And I think we're kind of coming back around to that. I, I see that here where I'm at at Hyundai, where specialists um, can no longer do their work in a, in a silo. It has to be more holistic to an overall plan and goal that's gonna get us to the right place. So I, I just think the more holistic everyone can be about their thinking. And then if you don't have data science or analytical skills that you're as part of your core, you know, expand yourself to your and and stretch yourself to understand it so you can then be on board with whatever everyone else is seeing. Yeah, so Andrew, I think that's so true. Ahead, like, 
No, I was just going to say that I, I do think you have, we, we though, some of our leg, these legacy companies need to be uh, intentional, though, because it is it is super easy to kind of say that, I, I you know, uh, to have leaders that might say, you know, I don't see the, the benefits immediately, <laughs> right? And also, you know, I will throw in, uh, we need a special kind of, uh, I think, you know, glass ball because, um, you know, uh, you can do all the listening. Um, some of our products still take 10 years to age and make. So if there's something that's moving, uh, you know, it, it can get a little hard to be like, okay, I, I need some more quickly. Um, but, uh, but no, I do think that being intentional. And so uh, we are definitely, uh, you know, looking at what is the, the right model and that I don't think it's, you know, responsible to think that you can get this generalist that can answer all of these things. You know, we're going to move to a little more of a specialist model as we evolve and adapt um, you know, to help, you know, upskill, you know, our, both our industry and our, our company. So Susan, I mean, what they're discussing obviously means, I mean, this comes down to process, right. And collaboration, the new ways of working together, because if it's impossible to find one person with, with all the skills and all the capabilities <laughs> together, um, that's going to be so important to find new ways to work together. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I just totally agree with what um, everyone has said about the, you know, need to sort of disrupt and also add analytics and, and insights into your overall marketing capabilities. Uh, but when you think about the overall team, I think it's, you know, we, we've talked about left brain, right brain as the title of this session, but I really think what's needed from the overall team is hyper left brain and hyper right brain thinking. And that does um, mean a championship team of, of specialists, people playing positions and then working together as a team to accomplish and, and maximize impact in the marketplace and connection with your customer. Um, when I think about how we're approaching that right now, we, you know, we've been a growth company um, three years ago. Many of our marketing executives were sort of generalists and wearing a number of hats. And we've talked through the three years about the need to narrow and deepen your, your remit and pass the ball um, to be able to work together and scale to a global marketing organization. And when I think about the kinds of people we've been hiring, we've had, you know, just like everyone limited, you know, a, a little bit more limited um, head, additional headcount this year. But the, the investments we're making are helping us become more of a hyper right brain and hyper um, left brain organization. Those investments are in creative and thought leadership, as well as insights, analytics and digital. Those are really the positions we're hiring to really round out our team. And then we revisit how we're operating with every project actually to make sure that we're, we're connecting the dots and, and working together in these sort of tiger teams. So let, let's talk a little bit about um, how you, just examples of how y'all have, have um, you know, met the new challenges, work you're particularly proud of, projects that you've developed and all in the you know, all in in the spirit of and to the end goal of uh, putting putting everybody back on a path to growth. Because clearly, I think there's been phases of reaction during 2020. You know, there was like crisis mode. There was sort of find your footing, and then it sort of move move into the next phase. All of it happening very very quickly. But um, Angela, perhaps you can share an example of something that you know shows how you've been able to bring all this that we're talking about together. Yeah, um, you know, like everyone, we were trying to make best bets as we could. And so well put, you know, there was the crisis mode or the, you know, the panic mode in those first couple of days. Um, and then I think we did some really good things. We had, uh, we relaunched Hyundai Assurance, which was a program for consumers. We cobbled together quickly a spot, got that on air by March 20th. I mean, those were very early days that was just giving consumers the confidence or that we have their back. If they bought a car and something happened to them with COVID-19 by the end of the year, that we could help them defer their payments. Um, and there were some other things like that we put into the marketplace. We, we did donations to COVID-19 testing centers um, across the country. But one thing that was a really breakthrough for us because we had not achieved um, any true success or where we wanted to, which was uh, digital retailing at the dealer level. And again, because we work with these incredible entrepreneurs that own dealerships across the country, they're our partners, um, you know, it's, it's up to them to bring that kind of technology and the skill sets into their dealerships in order to truly deliver what 
most people expect in how they shop and buy, uh, like they do on Amazon and, and with their banking and everything else. But when it comes to buying a car, you really do have to go physically to the dealership and see the car, test drive the car, you know, spend time in a F and I office, and then finally, hours later, um, you'll go home with the car um, that made you feel very exhausted because it is a very long process. And so, when dealers were getting shut down across the country, you know, it forced this. Um, need to be able to use these digital retailing tools so they could still sell and um, everything from doing all the shopping to online paperwork to doing in some states electronic signature that's um, state laws sometimes we need wet signatures but doing home delivery and so now we have a hundred percent of all of our dealers on these digital retailing platform um, with the, all the tools that come in with that and we went from maybe 50% to 100% within 30 days. And again, it was COVID that forced that new behavior. And well, you know, as things open up over time, I think seeing beautiful sheet metal still has its allure. Um, I think people will still go to the dealership. They certainly have a huge role in the process and by no means will that ever change. But if you could do a huge part of the paperwork so you could come in and just spend time with the car and really understanding what is now a computer on wheels, that would be the best benefit on both ends. So again, we cobbled together some creative to just let people know that we had a safe way for you to purchase a car if you needed one and had the ability to do so even up to home delivery. So I think we're gonna share um, a quick video of, of that creative that went on air around April timeframe. For Hyundai and its dealers, the health and safety of our local communities have always come first. And right now we're all safer at home. But should you need a vehicle, we have options to shop online, and a participating dealer will deliver it right to you. And to ease the financial strain, you'll make no payments for four months. Together, we can create a safer, better car buying experience. Get 0% APR for up to 84 months on the 2020 Tucson or Elantra and make no payments for four months. Visit buyhyundai.com today. That's great. So tell, so just walk us through really quickly again, you know, what had to happen to sort of make that come to life? I mean, what were, you know, were there shifts in, in your, uh, you know, your media plan, your agency partners, what kind of, you know, what, what is that a manifestation of in addition yeah. to what we've just been discussing? Well, I have to give a shout out to our advertising agency, a notion. Um, everyone went working from home. Uh, so not easy, right? Creative environments are very collaborative. Um, yeah. In media investments, initially we took uh, a lot of money down uh, just because, you know, who, why would you spend all that money? But we didn't want to go dark. Um, that was definitely a decision we had all made. Um, we wanted some messaging, again, about these programs to let people know if you had a need for a car, there was programs in place. And by the way, if you needed to buy a car, best time ever, because everyone was putting great incentives on the car. Um, and we were in a good place as a company because we had um, some good bets we'd made on inventory. So we had a lot of inventory on the ground that they could be shipped out to dealerships. Um, not all OEMs were in such a uh, the position we were so we were able to really st still sell a lot of cars even during that time in fact surprisingly so but it took coordination on many fronts i mean it had been years in development coming up with the platforms and actually selecting all the digital retailing tools that a dealer could put in place um, so that hard work had been done so they were literally sitting on the shelf and they just had to sign up they're given a person that they get to work with to help train, bring their people on. And that's working across all departments here from um, our, our dealer development group to our customer experience group. And then of course, working with our ad agency, uh, a notion on the creative, our media agency canvas, all of that was happening in real time. But you know, I think because we had a lot of it already in place and we just, we have the benefit of having people, we were able to move very, very quickly. So I would say by, I think that went on air by the end of probably the third week of April. So that was pretty fast. Um, and so it was, it was, you know, not the best creative in the whole wide world, but not, not bad for getting a message across. So. Absolutely. It was fantastic. Chad Bonin, talk a little bit about any, any sort of initiatives, work, um, or other projects that you all developed, um, during this period. Go ahead, Chad. No, I was just going to um, say that, you know, you can imagine in our world, a lot of live events. And so we had to quickly pivot. Uh, oh, I wasn't going to use the most overused. Right. Word. 
Um, um, we had to uh, move at pace um, and switch around um, to uh, w- one of them, which was, which I'm actually super excited it's coming up, which is the Vuclico Polo event. And ri- literally moving that to, you know, a virtual event, um, but with, you know, uh, some footage and other things that are, are out there. And that's what I've learned and what I think we will change I think it changes all of our lives forever as marketers, which is the signups for that. This is virtual. It's people looking for any reason to celebrate and get together, even if it's on Zoom um, or, you know, whatever uh, version you have because of just the need to, uh, you know, be with people, have a reason to celebrate. And so um, and so that's coming up. But it's going to be a great experiment for us because, you know, we partner with um, our, you know, e-com partners to deliver, you know, the baskets and the things that you would have had for your, you know, event, um, but now at home and, you know, with friends and it's a gifting, you know, moment. And so I was super excited, but that's just one example of the fun that I feel like we've gotten to have as marketers with these, these challenges provided. It's so interesting because you talk about those people who have just been chomping at the bit to be part of something, you know, even if it is virtual, but, but, and everybody talks about it, virtual sort of opened us up to new opportunities in terms of scale and, you know, the numbers of people that you can reach. I mean, there's just like, it'll be interesting to see how we hold on to those, you know, those benefits for lack of a better term or the the positives that have come from some of these new arrangements, even as we think about going back to, you know, a live event, like how, how how are you going to think about marrying those as you move forward? Well, I think think, what it, I think it allows us to is actually democratize a live event. You could only have a thousand people kind of at the main event anyway. Now the, the appetite just to expand it, you know, across both not only the country, but the world. So super, super excited by hanging on to those, you know, those muscle memories. Right. I think that there's no, you know, look, I had a pretty healthy speaking business until March, but um, I, I, you know, I've done a ton of the virtual events and it's interesting. I agree. I don't think there will ever be another conference, at least the the, the ones that really understand the possibility that will not have a virtual component that is robust i just don't you know at least those that understand because the numbers we've never seen these kind of numbers and interesting you talk to a lot like even when i will do like breakout sessions the level of engagement is first you can see everybody which is hard to do in an audience although don't get me wrong i miss a good crowd but you know the level of engagement is is really uh i think even higher it's very interesting yes it's been very very interesting um for us you know I started, I, uh, just like you, Angela, I didn't listen to the directions up front. I started in March, uh, <laughs> and, um, and so we were in L.A., and starting in March, and all of a sudden, the world shut down, and the big thing that we were supposed to do next was Coachella. And we all fly back, and we're in New York, and I, have this, I said, look, we should do Co-Triller, the virtual version of it. And, of course, we announced it, and Coachella slapped our hand and said, well, you're not going to call it that. We changed it to Triller Fest. But I was blown away. It showed kind of, I think, how deeply ingrained in uh, music culture we are as a platform. Um, and we had, in four weeks, we put on the largest virtual festival, largest virtual music festival ever. We had 177 acts submit to be a part of it. We actually ended up with 108, and it's big guys like Pitbull, Migos, Lil Wayne, Snoop Dogg. I mean, like, and then a bunch of emerging artists who would never have a chance to be on a card with any of those artists, at least at this stage right now. So they feel amazing. They're getting their fan base. Uh, we ended up doing 34 hours of content across three days. We had three streaming platforms. Forums. We had two charities, so we delivered a ton of value, you know, to the cause from artists who wanted to give back and find ways to give back. And again, small and big artists. And then we um, we we did five million concurrent views at uh, at our peak, which is insanity, right? Like where, and that's globally around the world. And so, yeah, I think I was super proud of our ability to even pull that off in four weeks with that many artists and just even just getting agreements and all that kind of stuff. But it also changed the way we look at, like we had to really do something because again, we're here, like the labels are big investors and our artists themselves are big investors in us uh, actually in the company because of what we do to help them build their business. So we really wanted to provide tools for them to continue to build that business. So we took what we learned from that virtual festival and built a product so that artists could then use that product to create ticketable 
virtual events. And so we had small bands that have never had, you know, the size of audience that they were able to pull using our virtual ticketed platform. And they were also still making money. And so we were able to give back. Then we started building out commerce products for, um, for the influencers. And then of course, in the midst of all this, we decide that we're going to, uh, put on the Tyson fight, the largest probably live event that will happen in the next nine, 12 months from now. Uh, and we're going to put it on in a socially distant way. We've got three hours worth of programming, two music stages, a ring with Tyson and Roy Jones, and then three undercards underneath that. And it's like, but what what has come together, and by the way, we have to do the weigh-ins virtually. We have to do the the workouts. We have to, I mean, like all the pieces that come with a fight uh, and then the pieces that come with a music concert. But what's been interesting, I think, and what I'll be proud of uh, come November 28th, I could use the pay-per-view buy. So if you want to buy it, it's on pay-per-view. It's live from pay-per-view, 100 million households. So any anybody listening, please buy. But what is going to be interesting is kind of the techniques that we're creating so that even though you're watching it, on pay-per-view, so it'll feel like pay-per-view. But if you turn on the virtual version, you'll be able to feel like you're almost in the audience with different types of views and zoom ins and like and so it'll be fascinating to see how you can kind of take that and use that even moving forward, even when you can have people inside of events. So really proud of the team just moving mountains to kind of but to create stuff that can potentially have lasting impact for industries and and kind of the way we consume content. So that's exciting. That's, I mean, personally, I find that so fascinating to think about. I mean, I, just just the innovation that's being forced in that regard is 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 mind blowing uh, and and super exciting. And we're on, we're so close to running out of time. But I got to ask this question, and, and Susan, I'd love for you to chime in here, and on, and then I also see how everybody else. Um, wants to weigh in, but it is around this measurement question because certainly, as everybody's you know, technology virtual has become the only game in town. Um, you know how how has you know the use of technology this year made possible new forms of measurement that weren't possible before, or have heightened your ability to measure in new ways? I, you know, Susan, if you have some thoughts on that, that would be great. Then would love to have. It's certainly um, I, I can talk about sort of our platform in general because um, I. Many, many marketers um, now are, of course, meeting with their CFOs um, more frequently. I i don't know if, if you all feel that way, but yes, I've spent a, quite a bit of time with our new CFO, Blake, and going over our investments. And we're being challenged, you know, just like every marketer, to um, not just measure our results, but um, really tie our results more directly to business outcomes. And that's what's so fantastic about our platform and um, just our the digital media landscape now is you can solve for um, revenue, you can solve for store visits or dealer visits. The technology is there to really hone in on tying marketing investment to business outcomes. And that's what we're seeing, you know, lots and lots of questions and work coming in from clients that are talking to us ab about that right now. Um, from a from a, just a trade desk perspective, um, we are um, really focusing in um, very specifically in the US on overall engagement metrics and have set up, done an incredible job in the last few months ingesting our data, doing basic dashboards, like all of the sort of plumbing that we've needed to do. We are there finally as a growth company, so it's, it's super exciting. But one of the insights that we've really gained is the job is different um, in different countries around the world, depending on our maturity and our size. And so we're now really, um, really creating metrics and goals that are distinct by market and then um, able to customize our marketing efforts by market to achieve those goals. So that's also something that's just really exciting to get to as, as a growth company. That's fantastic. Any last thoughts, uh, Angela, Chad, Bonin, um, around this, this concept of you drive for growth? Uh, you know, I would say, again, in the auto industry, we have a ton of data. Um, it, there's just so much, not just even for marketing. Yes, we spend a lot of time in front of our finance team, too. I think when I was at the agency side, um, the previous CMO, he would call this a fixed marketing investment budget. It is technically a fixed marketing expense budget. Um, <laughs> so it has to ladder up to um, some pretty stringent parameters. Um, it is not spent without a ton of data behind it. But there's tools that we were building 
a year to a year and a half ago that we thought were really important for us to understand. One was, you know, what was the true quality of a lead, which, you know, who is supposed to convert that lead and how do we really know that that person's showing up at the dealership? And so we had spent time um, with a company to build a platform that was able to tell through your phone if you were showing up at a dealership. And um, really smart tool, really helpful to know. Um, But you know what, now we have all these digital retailing tools and those are telling us about a different way that people are shopping and buying for a car. So, you know, this foot traffic tool that we spent time to build suddenly seems like it's been lowered on the list of priorities because we've got, a, a, a you know, it's coming up to about 20% of people are buying and shopping online completely. So I don't even need to know that they're going to the dealership and, and nor do I really care. So those are really interesting things that are happening um, just in the laddering of importance of where the data falls. So, you know, I, I expect that to continue to change as we move, move forward. Yeah, I think that um, really, I think, look, Everything should be measured. I definitely 100% agree with Angela. At the end of the day, you're investing money and you want to return on that. I think one of the challenges, though, is that sometimes a lot of times we look at things and we feel like they can't be measured. And I think one of the things is the art of structuring things so they can be measured. And I know, I'm sure many of you know kind of how I am, like, drop a guy out of the sky with no parachute on and no wingsuit, let him land on a net, right? And everybody's like, what? And I don't know how you measure that stunt realistically. I guess we can look at Nielsen and Lyft. So instead, I structured it where we were actually selling it as a piece of IP. So we made money and we had a goal to make money or like we built houses for Sour Pass before houses were cool for creators. Right. And people are like, how are we going to measure that? And, you know, we tied that um, to uh, a sale. Like, so I think you got to structure programs so that they can be measured and not let the creativity scare you away from big ideas or ideas, but then shape them so that they can actually fit into something that can truly be measured. Totally agree with that. Chad, any, any last thoughts on that? Ditto. <laughs> Pivot. Pivot. What he said. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, we we are just about out of time. Um I you know, I, I think it's just fascinating to think about. It's exciting, it's been challenging. I mean, there are no words really. And um It'll be just so exciting, I think, for us to move forward from here. It sounds like all of you are motivated and 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 really excited about the possibility that that this year has created. Because at the end of the day, if we can't find sort of that opportunity right. um, in the trials that we've had, um, it, it all would have been for naught. So, um, exactly. so excited to see what comes from all of you uh, as we move into 2021. And Susan, unless you have any final thoughts to share with our audience. No, just thanks, everyone. Thanks to this great group, um, Chad, Bonin, Angela, of course, the amazing Jenny Rooney. Thank you so much for participating in our CMO keynote for Groundswell Digital Marketing Festival. And um, yeah, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Benny. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.